It's interesting, Alan. I would not have guessed that the male, very different corporate structure, very different values and ethos and market. It's interesting that the two of you are the ones who've adopted this internationalization uh, and available without charge model. And I mean, they've obviously got what well, they're the most successful mm. uh, English language newspaper in the world online. Well, what do you think of their product? Well, it, it's, it's very interesting. It's very different from the, the printed product. Um, uh, I mean, I, I don't know how often Paul Dacre looks at the Mail website. But, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, I mean, on, honestly, I don't know. Um, um, the, the, the paper, love it or loathe it, is very politically engaged and I, I think tries its best to be quite, quite a serious political paper. Uh, you look at the website and it, it is something completely different and it is going for a very mass celebrity wow. market. Uh, and it, as you say, it's been ruthless, ruthlessly successful in, in, in doing that. The, the problem, if you play that game, is you're up against people who are 10 times, 100 times larger than you are. Mm. You need a sidebar of shame, Alan, on the website. We, we have thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> have, you thought, have you thought about other models? I mean, they're, they're clearly there's the, the, the News International, the Times model, uh, which is different to the FT and the Telegraph model. How far... Did you stumble into this way of doing it? And how far did you sit down and consider them all and uh, choose this one? Well, if you, if you, if you begin journalistically, I, I, um, I'm, I, should, I should say, first of all, I think it's a good idea that everybody is trying different models. I think it is good that the Times has a completely closed model. New York Times is sort of semi-permeable and The Guardian is completely open. You know, I, I think we will learn from each other and it may be that we all have different models at the end of it. I don't know of a single journalist, a single journalist, who would prefer to have a, a, a closed model. Um, I, I think if you work for the Times or the Sunday Times <coughs> and you, you tweet your pieces knowing that no one's ever going to click on them because, because you're going to have to pay and go through a paywall uh, and that your work is going to be read by a tiny number of people, is not going to be shared, distributed, read abroad, um, to bounce around the world. I can't think of any journalist who would prefer that to the open model. So I think journalistically, there is no question that the open model is, I mean, not miles better, light years better. Um, so the question is whether one works financially better than the other. Uh, and it's, all, it's difficult to tell. I mean, I, as I say, we made something, I'm looking at David, whether I'm allowed to say this, but getting on for 70 million last year in, in digital revenues. Uh, and e each year we're doing better than we thought we would. Uh, and that's from a, a daily audience of about 5.4 now million. And I think the Times recently said that their daily audience was around 130,000. So it, it's, it's just mm. completely different so scale impact, and idea. You get impact. There's this old joke about Hitler went off <coughs> and told some of his top scientists they had to make, learn how to make butter out of manure. And they went away uh, to make butter out of manure. And then Hitler came back and said, how are you getting on? And they said, we're halfway there. And he said, oh, what have you done? And they said, well, we've got it to spread very well. <laughs> and it slightly feels like we're there. You know, you've, you, you've achieved half. But getting it to financial viability, that last bit is going yeah, to be well, formidable it, it, challenge, it, it's isn't it? Not, it's, it's not going to happen overnight. It just isn't. Mm. Um, you know, we, we have to produce a, a, a paper every day. That's an enormous um, undertaking. Your industry hasn't yet worked out how you're going to make all this work. Um, your clients are some way behind you. So it's not, there's not going to be a magic moment in the next couple of years where it's all going to work. But, but the, the advantage of the trust is that you have people who are not shareholders, who are not wanting instant return, who say, well, actually, we're in this for the long game. The, the only thing that I have to do is to make sure The Guardian is there in perpetuity. So when I think about perpetuity, I think that's probably going to be digital. Uh, and, and I look at the behavior of the young people and how they share and distribute uh, and, and, and collect and read information. Uh, and I think it's, it looks more like how we're behaving mm. than people who are hiding behind big paywalls, which is essentially a 19th century business model. Mm. Um. You're halfway through a five-year transformation plan at the moment. I mean, where does that actually end? What is the... It's not 
ending with the end. It's not taking away print at the end of that, is it? I mean, that's no. another 10 or 15 years, probably, I would think, is it? Well, we, we, again, it's impossible to tell. I mean, you, you, you must all be having the same discussions, but um, it, hands up, who knows Claire Enders? So you know who I mean. I mean, she, she, she enters an analysis. So she, she's probably, you know, the person who studies the newspaper industry in this country most closely. Uh, and she came in about three years ago when we were doing one of our periodic, what's it all going to look like? And she just drew a line that went straight into the ground. Um, uh, and I, I guess all newspaper managements were looking at the same line. Um, so the, actually, it's not very hard to decide that that's a bad option. Uh, and the digital line goes like that, so why don't we go on the digital line rather than the print line? Um, but actually, something r rather odd has happened in the last six months, which is print has stopped falling. It's actually growing. And I'm not sure we can completely explain that, but it just shows how difficult it is to mm. project and plan at the moment. Mm. An important <coughs> thing for an agile organization and for a leader in an agile organization is to carry staff with him or her. Um, two things, really. Your staff are, I suppose they're like BBC staff, and like many of the staff at the organisations represented here, they are they're not people like being carried. I mean, they are intellectual, mm. they're clever, they're sharp, they have their own views, they're creative. Um, take us back to when you arrived at The Guardian, and you did have a bit of a job to do to bring in those bright youngsters and to make sure there were no pots of stagnation around the, the, the organisation. How, how do you go about taking staff with you? Well, it was, it was relative. I mean, I look back now to 1995, it was relatively simple. Um, you, had a, you were working in print, there were words on the page and there were adverts. And as long as you got the right balance between the words on the page and the adverts, that was about it. Um, uh, and now it, it, it feels like a, a sort of a massive three-dimensional thing between social, between print, between video, between graphics, um, between mobile, between infinite... I mean, the, the, the number of factors you're juggling and trying to understand, it, it's infinitely more complex. And in, in terms of bringing people with you, the, the, the really tricky bit is it's, it is impossible at any point. I mean, you can say, please follow me. I, I, I think I can see the future. Uh, and you can imagine what that is like with a bunch of cynical journalists uh, who, um, <laughs> who, who don't follow anybody. Um, and, and you can't prove it. You can't say, I promise you if you follow me, it's going to be all right. All you can say is, I, I, I believe, my, my best guess is that if, if, you, if you go on this path, it will be all right. And we all know that 2008 was a terrible year, 2009 was a terrible year, 2000. So it's really been about four years before you could convincingly stand up in front of the staff and say, actually, it really is working. And so the, on the only way that we could bring people with us was to get people in groups and, and, and throw them the same scenarios that we had been playing with ourselves. And nearly always, they came to the, to the same the solution. Same and and, and at, least, at, at least they have then been through the same intellectual exercise so that whatever you decide to do doesn't seem completely irrational because mm. they've thought it through for themselves. I think at the, in an interview shortly after you became editor, you said, by and large, I believe in cuddly management and that is what I'm practising. You're a bit more of a veteran now, really. Do you still believe in cuddly management or do you believe in more Thatcherite kind of style? Um, well, I don't, I don't, somewhere between cuddly and Thatcherite. Um, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, the, the thing I've just described of, of trying to get people to decide, to, to think things through for themselves, I, I mean, that, I think that's mm. what, what I mean by cuddly. But, but I, you know, in the end, somebody has to make a decision and people are not going to like that. And, and maybe I've got a tiny bit, sort of, a bit more on the sort of less cuddly side as years go mm. on. Mm. <coughs> is it harder in left-wing organisations? I mean, it's not a left-wing organisation, but it is a left-of-centre newspaper, obviously. And I... I wonder whether that creates particular management channel uh, challenges in being agile. I mean, we've seen this whole example of the co-op. Mm. Nord Miners is duffing up the co-op at the moment and uh, it perhaps needed some change. He, he was your, he was your mm. chairman too of, of, of the mm. parent, wasn't he? Mm. And it, 
Is it, is it harder in an organisation that operates I, I, don't, by I don't think it's so much the left wing. I, I think I mean, there's something about a trust. So, you know, I've, I've gone on about the, 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 um, the independence of the long-term thinking. The, the, the other thing a trust obviously gives you is that there is nobody about the editor. So there is n nobody who can tell me what to think. So that, that thing that usually happens in newspapers is, is there's usually somebody up there who is a, a peer or an international businessman or, <laughs> or an oligarch. Um, so that it, it's usually quite a sort of vertical thing. And on the Guardian, it's it's the opposite. It is it is horizontal. That there is nobody up there, uh, and that is completely brilliant. I mean, during the during the Snowden affair, there were repeated attempts to try and nobble me by politicians, and they just couldn't work out how to do it because they they tried to go through the board, and the board said, "Sorry, we're not allowed to talk to him," <laughs> uh, and they went to the trust, and the trust said, "Sorry, we're not allowed to talk to him about editorial matters," uh, and so they were left with me. Um, uh, so it's, it's a brilliant thing in terms of guaranteeing um, independence, but it does mean that, that the sort of um, you know the sort of command and control way of running things works less well. Mm. It has to work by discussion and persuasion. Mm. One of the great dilemmas for organisations trying to be agile and to adapt is this conflict between <coughs> speed uh, and care. Uh, do you rush things and <laughs> potentially get them wrong, or do you take time, think about them, decide, uh, and then potentially get them wrong? I mean, an interesting case study in that is the Berliner format for the paper, and I'd, I'd be interested in your reflection on that, because it did all seem to happen really quite quickly. I don't know whether it was as quick as it looked, but essentially the Independent went small, the Times went to a small and large, and then pff, they all just toppled and we went to the the tabloid size newspapers and you stuck your neck out and went for this slightly different uh, this different uh, Berliner format. I mean how do you make up the sort of how do you decide between jumping one way or sort of standing around waiting to see how the market plays out? Well it was a very um, how many people remember that? That was a, it was a long time yeah okay a few yeah okay I mean what, what, it actually what, wasn't that long ago, but well, it, 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 well, it seems ten, like it. It was it, ten it, years yeah, ago. Yeah. It seems it seems like an aeon. So what what happened then was incredibly profound, and and the, the really profound thing, nobody remarked on at all. So, the independent overnight moved, and and Simon Kellner kept saying this. He kept saying we're stopping being a newspaper. We're going to become a views paper. I mean, I can't think of a more profound change in 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 the idea of what a what news is. No, nobody discussed that at all. They, they all said. <laughs> Oh, isn't it interesting? It's changing shape. <laughs> um, so there were, there were two problems for, for us. One was that in those days, we had so much advertising. This is hard to believe, but we did. So much advertising that if we'd gone tabloid, we'd have had to produce 200-page tabloids on some days. Pause for gasps. But the, the, <laughs> if you can't remember how thick The Guardian was then, um, so a 200-page tabloid was obviously hopeless because what, what you gained in a smaller size was... Um, was you know you had this thing that would fall apart on the tube, um, but the other thing was I didn't think actually we would win against. Do you remember the, the Simon Kellner front pages, where they were very dramatic and bold? Mm. He was consciously echoing the Daily Mail, the Daily Mail, the most successful paper in the market, and everybody secretly wonders what the Daily Mail's trick is. And so Simon thought he would make the Independent into a left-wing version of the Daily Mail, uh, and I simply didn't want to get drawn into that battle. I, mean, I, I don't really believe in the notion of a newspaper anyway, of a views paper. Uh, and I, I thought if the battle is going to be who can do the, f f the catchiest front page. So I did something which was to swim in the opposite direction, which was to scale back the headlines, put multiple stories on the front page, uh, and be more serious. Um, and um, I, I have no regrets about doing that. Mm -hmm. What re regrets, looking back over it, over your two decades, almost. Uh, what regrets do you have? Where were you not agile enough? Uh, well, but pr probably generally in terms of speed, um, there was a period about three years ago when we, we got a guy called Marty Kagan in from the West Coast who looked at the number of developers we had and said, in terms of your ambition, your development team is probably 20% of what it should be. So we now have about 130 developers at the time, we had about 30. Uh, and I think that, that was holding us back, so we weren't moving fast enough. 
Uh, and I think the other thing that, that we didn't, we, we haven't moved fast enough is video. Uh, and we, we will move this year in video, um, but it just, There's a lot it was of a video really hard around. thing. There's a lot of video around. There's a lot of video around. around and, but again, if you, if you think about how our children, how our younger friends um, behave and how they, they consume, uh, a, a lot of it is video, mm. especially on mobile, and mm. we can't afford not to be in video. Have you ever got to watch the whole of an advert and not clicked skip now to avoid the ad? No, well, I keep having this argument with David. Is, is it an argument or is it a discussion? It's, a, it's, it's a an applied <laughs> discussion. I mean, I, I don't think pre-rolls are necessarily the best formats for videos. Am I allowed to say that? Not really. No, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, if, if it's a short clip of video, I, there, there are not many people, in my view, who are going to watch through. I'm, I'm, I'm digging myself into a terrible hole, aren't I? This is getting worse. Um, I, I think there are other formats that we're looking at for. Um, um, but I mean, if, if you look at something like Vice, which has, um, you, you know, while, while the grass has been growing on our, under our feet in terms of video, has, has done something quite extraordinary and is making buckets of money, I, I, I think. You know, there are, there are exciting things we should be doing. Mm. We do need to finish because the purpose of this event actually is not us. It's for them to mingle uh, with each other. And I want to give them mingling time, plenty of mingle time. J just a thought on the advertising world and for the advertisers and your view of them. They are basically paying quite a lot of your product. Are you happy with advertisers? Or? Yeah, I think... Um I, I, I mean, I, I never know quite who the, the fault is because I'm, you all blame each other, with, whether it's the clients or the agencies. <laughs> um, but I, I, think, I think sometimes I, f I feel frustrated at the conservatism that I, I feel in, in the way that people are thinking about advertising uh, and particularly the, you know, the, the revolutions we're going through. You know, pr print to digital is, is the most obvious one. Text to video is another one. I, I, th I think maybe the most profound one is social. Uh, and, you know, we haven't talked about, the, you know, the big fork in, in the road, I think, for us was this thing of being closed or open. And the, the paywall is obviously the most o obvious manifestation of what people m take to mean between closed and open. Uh, we take it differently. We, we, we think this revolution in which every, everybody in this room can be a publisher is, is, is sort of epoch, uh, epochally, what's, what's it? epoch, epochal, yeah. epochal, very good, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is um, epochally important. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say. He's it's a newspaper um, editor, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I love, I love Not playing, a sub-editor, he's the words. editor, yeah. he's allowed to make words up. Um, epochally important. Uh, <laughs> And, um, and I'm not sure, I, I, let, let's, there are not many clients here today, so let's blame the clients. Um, uh, I'm not, what? There are quite a few clients here. There's, there are some, <laughs> only, only the most enlightened clients are here today, but there are some really unenlightened clients who wouldn't be seen dead at an event like this, who I don't think quite get that. Mm. Just one, just one last, one last one. Um, really, we need don't we, to save, save a, a healthy, vibrant, five newspaper industry where we have good newspapers, well-resourced, print and online, we need three dailies to go out of business. Don't we? It's, just, it's just ridiculous overcapacity in this market. How does, it, how do we, how does that happen? It's just, it's, we're not, we don't seem to be seeing papers exiting the market, mm. which is what happens when the technology changes and the, the demand for that product diminishes. Well, I'm, I'm going to make a very cheap point here, Evan, and say the same was true of the BBC. We need the <laughs> BBC to go out of the market. Um, but, I, but, I, but I never do say that, because as, as, a, as a citizen, I think the BBC is the most wonderful uh, institution in Britain, along with the National Health Service and da da da. <coughs> um, so I, um, I, I think it, it, it is a, a tremendous public good having the BBC there and I think it's a tremendous public good having all these newspapers too and so when every time a Lebedev or a Richard Desmond or a Maxwell or a Barclay Brothers and comes in and, and props up an ailing newspaper it, it is I mean it does distort the market but I think in terms of the, the, the sort of democratic good and the, and the discussion and the diversity of views uh, it, it's a good thing um, 
So um, I sort of hate it as a competitor, love it as a citizen. Mm. Well, when you got your job, uh, Alan, <coughs> someone wrote, uh, Alan Rusbridge's Young Turks, like the eager young Blairites, cannot deny the ageing process. They too will succumb to sluggishness. Actually, what's been interesting is you haven't. You've gone on for 20 years, permanent revolution, constantly adapting, uh, and also winning Pulitzer Prizes, uh, as The Guardian did. I think Alan's given us plenty of food for thought. You're going to get, I think, a little more food in your generous two-course meal here today. And, uh, <laughs> but I think we should thank Alan Rusbridger. Alan, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>